Hello and welcome to Love Thy Lawyer, where we talk to real lawyers about their lives in and out of the practice of law, how they got to be lawyers, and what their experience has been. I'm Lewis Goodman, the host of the show, and yes, I'm a lawyer. Nobody's perfect. His background is in bankruptcy law. He has worked as an associate in a large firm and as a partner. More recently, he has transitioned to being a published author, and perhaps his most useful professional knowledge is of jazz and barbecue joints in Kansas City, Missouri. He now lives in Denver, Colorado. Mark Shaken, welcome to Love Thy Lawyer. Thanks very much, Lewis. I'm really excited to be on your show. It's a real privilege to have you. You are someone who has managed to escape the gravitational pull of the legal profession. And I'd like to explore a little bit about how you got to the legal profession and how you got out. The bulk of your practice has been involved with bankruptcy law. Is that correct? That's right. And where are you from originally? Born in Queens, and we lived in Queens, and then Long Island, and and then high school was in New Haven, Connecticut. Oh, yeah? What high school did you go to? Richard C. Lee High School, which no longer exists. It's now the Yale Nursing School. (laughs) (laughs) Well, how was that experience at uh, Richard Lee? It it was actually... I enjoyed my high school experience, and Lee High School was a great place to get all the different kinds of education that one should be getting when they're in high school. And when you graduated from high school, where'd you go to college? Yeah, I was really lucky. I got into Haverford College, which is on the main line outside Philadelphia. How'd that go? That was quite a different experience, going from a very urban inner city high school setting where I was bussed in to achieve uh, integration to mostly a preppy kind of college, being fed by some of the you know the best private schools in the country, which I didn't go to. So it, it, it was also an educational experience, and I had quite a bit of catching up and getting up to speed to do. Besides academics, what sort of things did you participate in in college? I played basketball for a couple of years and ran track for a couple of years. And I thought both of those were getting in the way of the academics, to be honest. And so... Somewhere around junior year, I got much more serious about why I was in. I mostly wrote and photographed for the newspaper. The school newspaper was my main outside academics activity. At some point, you went to law school. Did you take some time off between graduating from college and going to law school, or did you go directly? I took a year off. I I had no idea as I was reaching my senior year in in college what I was going to do when I graduated. And when I graduated, I still didn't have any good idea what I was going to do. So I got a job. I got a a couple of different blue-collar jobs while I was sort of sorting all this out, which was an unusual path, I suppose, for having gone to such a fancy dancy college. The main blue collar job I had was I drove a forklift on the graveyard shift at a frozen bakery. And then I got engaged and decided to go to law school because I figured that would give me three more years to figure out what I would do. Where'd you go to law school? I went to law school at Washburn University, which is in Topeka, Kansas. My wife, who had just gotten married when I started law school, got into veterinary school at Kansas State. And so off we went to Kansas to get her trained and get me this three years of figuring out what I would really do with my life. So your path into the law really involved giving yourself more time to decide what you wanted to do. Yeah, I was kind of an accidental law student. And you could argue I was an accidental attorney for 38 years while I continued to try to figure out what I was really going to do with my life when I grew up. But I, I, I didn't, you know, law school is filled with different kinds of uh, paths into school. And there are other people, I wasn't the only one that kind of went to law school because that was the best thing they could think of to do, not because they really wanted to be a lawyer. That was me. You know, there were plenty of people in law school from a young age who knew they wanted to be a lawyer. And there they were in law school to achieve that. I, that wasn't me. Well, when you graduated from law school, you did some clerking for a bankruptcy judge, and that's kind of how you got into the bankruptcy world. Is that correct? That's 100% correct. You know, back in those days, there was no internet. We didn't have you know, electronic devices. And so there was a three by five card that the, ju- the bankruptcy judge put up at the placement office in the law school. 
And so this is first semester, third year of law school. I still had no idea what I was going to be doing with myself, you know, shortly when I graduated. And this card went up and almost on a, on a, a lark, I, I applied and because I hadn't taken the bankruptcy class in law school. And I, lo- I loved him from the first time I met him. And, and the dean let me into an already full bankruptcy class so I could pull all of this off. And that's really how I got introduced to bankruptcy, also completely accidentally. I, I had, had thoughts that if I was going to actually be a practicing lawyer, I'd be a tax lawyer. And instead, I got my two plus years of intense bankruptcy training, you know, at the judge's footsteps. And the rest is kind of history. That's just all I've ever done. Well, what was the experience like going into the big firm? The bankruptcy part of it was was wonderful. The cases were amazing. I've often joked that I peaked at a very early age. I mean, I get to Texas, I'm you know, 28 years old, and you know, humongous companies are filing Chapter 11 bankruptcy cases, and the phone never stops ringing. There isn't any need to go out and, and try to generate business for the partners. They can't handle the business that, that they're getting when the phone is. And, you know, the courts couldn't handle it either. The backlog in the Southern District of Texas was spectacular. There were hearings where the judge was in the courtroom and the lawyers on motion day couldn't get to the courtroom. And so the judge would call a case and this the, the hallway was filled with the lawyers. And so somebody would have to yell out, you know, who's got the Brown versus you know, Jones case? And whoever had that is running from the back of the hallway to get into the courtroom to have the judge tell him that there isn't going to be a trial because he's backed up for the next year. So it, it was a remarkable experience at a time when the rest of the country really wasn't doing badly economically, but the oil and gas sector of the um, economy had simply tanked. Now, you wrote a book called And Just Like That, that, by the way, has nothing to do with Sarah Jessica Parker or anything having to do with the Sex and the City remake. What a shock. I was waiting for the royalty checks to start ro- rolling in <laughs> from the TV show. <laughs> and you talk in great detail about what it's like to be an associate at a big firm. Can yes. you tell us a little bit about that experience and some of the feeling of it that you outline in the book. You know, law school, while it does a wonderful job of teaching you how to think like a lawyer, it still doesn't do a very good job of letting you know what it's going to be like should you go into a, a law firm setting and, you know, be the lowest person on the the, the ladder. Yeah, you know, it was a surprise. They They certainly get their pound of flesh, they being the firm. You talk a little bit about this frightening process of moving from being an associate to partner. Tell us a little bit what that's about, because, again, that's something that is totally outside my realm of experience. You know, when you come up for partner, the, the your name gets debated on a Saturday, at least that's how the Kansas City firm did it, and then the partners all vote, and they vote, you know, typically if, if you get put up for partner, that's because they know you'll probably get the ro- votes necessary. So you get the phone call that you're in and it, it's exciting. And then you realize the next day that nothing's changed. You, 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 you still have lots of people above you on the totem pole. And it, it always struck me that there were really three kinds of partners in a, in a law firm, you know, partners in training, which in, in the book I call PITs, partners in, in charge, I call those PICs, and then the partners really in charge, the handful of partners that are running the firm that, that when they tell you to do something, that's, that's the gospel, and those I call PRICs in the book. And that was always my, my impression. Later in my career, I guess I became one of those you know, PRICs, and I tried to remember that it was possible to be a PRIC and still be kinder and gentler, but... You know, you could you could see the concern and worry in people's faces when a PRIC comes into an, an associate's office or even a young partner's office and closes the door behind them to have it. But it's very hierarchical, and, and I think that's a function of the really big firms. They just they all do it, and they all have it, and they all they all have these different types of partner folks. When you're an associate, obviously. The big problem you have is being overwhelmed with work, research, writing, uh, projects that are assigned to you. When you're a partner, 
What's the big problem? Lots of work still, because there's still people giving you work, especially if you're in the, the lower categories. And, you know, in a bankruptcy group, whenever there's a bankruptcy case that comes in, somebody in the bankruptcy group is going to do it. So y- you don't really get the opportunity to say that your plate's full. With respect to the partners who are really in charge, are they primarily concerned with getting new clients, rainmaking, so to speak, and being able to bring in the business that can keep the firm afloat? Yeah, well, hopefully by the time they become a, a, a partner really in charge, they have the book, the book of business because they probably would never have gotten to be the partner really in charge without it. And so what they should have been doing is cultivating a network and cultivating a, a client group when they become a partner in training. And just continue to build on it because that doesn't really happen overnight. That that's a real process. You spent a long time practicing law, and it strikes me that you're a bright guy. You could have lots of opportunities to do other things if you so chose. There must be something about practicing law that you really liked. It, it was intellectually challenging and intellectually exciting. If a young person was coming out of college and thinking about a career move. Would you recommend going into law as a career move? That's a really interesting question. I'm not smart enough to know whether somebody else should go to law school and whether they'll have a a great career or whether they'll go to law school and and hate it. What do you think is the best advice you've ever received? Yeah, that's that's another really good question. So I remember when I was finishing my clerkship, the, the judge took me out to lunch and he, he looked at me and he just nodded his head knowingly and said, you know, the practice of law isn't all it's cracked up to be. And I should have, I should have taken his advice and then ex- had him expound on it, and I didn't. Do you think the bankruptcy system is fair? I do. I think, you know, it's, it's, got, it's a huge code. It's not quite as big as the tax code, but it's, it's massive. And it's been around. We've had a, a, a uniform bankruptcy code since 1898, so we've had a lot of experience with it. We went through a big revision in 1978. But it, it's necessary for a society like ours to provide a safe for, for, for debtors and to have a system that is you know fair. And I've often encouraged uh, associates to go to court and sit there and see who's going into that courtroom and and decide, as you're telling me that bankruptcy is unfair, whether you would want to trade places with a single person that you just saw walk into that courtroom. So uh, I, I really do think it's, it's important, and, and it is fair. At some point, you decided that you weren't going to be the PRIC and go into the field of writing, and you resigned from the firm and decided to be an author. And you have two books that are out and published, and you're working on a third. What prompted that career decision? That's really what I wanted to do when I graduated from college. Yeah, but at some point you decided towards the end of your legal career that you wanted to get out of the law and go into writing. And I'm Mm -hmm. curious about what that process was like and how... The people around you, your wife, other family members, friends, perhaps, how they saw that move and how you saw it. The easy one is my wife. She was super supportive. I mean, she had to listen to me every night for 38 years, come home and say, that's the last day I'm not going back tomorrow. <laughs> so for her, that wasn't that wasn't a heavy lift to, to be supportive. The, the firm, it was very interesting. I, I, yeah, I was concerned about how the firm was going to react, and they actually reacted really well. Let's say you came into some real money. You and your wife came into three or four billion dollars. <laughs> what, if anything, would you do differently in your life? Wow. It's hard to imagine. I, I would be giving it away just as fast as I could to the organizations that I love right now that you know get a lot less money from me, but if I had billions, they'd get a lot more money from me. Let's say somebody gave you 60 seconds on the Super Bowl. You could put out any ad, any message, anything you wanted to a really enormous audience, really big microphone, really big platform. What is it that you would want to say in your 60-second ad on the Super Bowl? 
so right after I would say go Chiefs, I, I guess right after that message, which would be terribly important, I, I would I would then have to I would then have to sort of almost quote, you know, Rodney King after the, you know, during the riots, after he was after he was roughed up by the police significantly. You know, he said, you know what, well, you know, can't, can't we all just get along? And so I don't think it would take me 60 seconds, but maybe I could come up with uh, a video uh, to go along with that. Because that's, that's how, I, maybe it's because I'm getting old, but that's how I feel, that we don't get along and, and we don't, right now don't seem to have any interest in getting along. Mark, if someone wants to communicate with you, get a hold of you, uh, talk to you about writing or bankruptcy or your books, is there a way that people can contact you? Yeah, I think the easiest way is to go to the webpage, which is markshakenauthor.com. And there you can connect with me pretty easily. You can sign up for a mailing list if, if you're so inclined. I am pretty active on social media, so you can find me on Facebook and LinkedIn. And you can find my email address there too to 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 connect if if you if you'd like to. It's it's been very interesting. I, I get emails from for the first book. I get emails from lawyers all over the world that I don't know who have read the book and you know and have questions, comments. It's oftentimes, they wondered if I could talk to them for a half hour. I'm not a career counselor, but I'm happy to. And we have a phone call. So that that's been very unexpected. Very unexpected. That's Your whole book was kind of unexpected to me. Read it in, you know, primarily just in preparation for this interview. That's why I started reading it. And then as I started going through it, I really ended up slowing down with it and saying, wow, the, you know, th- this is really interesting. This is something people should know. This is something that is a real inside look at an aspect of practicing law. And it's not the law that I practice. And as you've said, there's lots of different people practicing law. There's lots of different ways to practice law. But this was such a great inside look at a certain type of legal practice. And I really appreciated the book. I thought it was extremely readable and 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 a real really fun to to take a look inside that world of the big firm. Well, thanks. It was a labor, no question about it. I, I actually started writing a couple of the pieces, and I, I mentioned in the chapters which ones I had started. You know, twenty five plus years ago, riding the subway in Philadelphia to get to work, which was an interesting way to write to start writing a book. And then I I I, I just wasn't mature enough or ready in that point in my life to, to really go through with it. So I set it aside until after I finished with my firm. But it, it it's it's interesting because all professions are difficult. You know, surgeons, super high stress, engineers, all the, all the professions are rough. But there's something about law that, that is has an add-on, at least it did for me. And, you know, that phrase about the jealous mistress that one of the Supreme Court judges coined, the law is a jealous mistress. And and it is. It it competes. It's almost animated. It competes for your attention. And it's hard to turn off, or it was for me. I think it's very, very true. I, You know, I talked to a lot of lawyers for this podcast. I think you have to have some really compelling reason to be a lawyer, you know, beyond just earning a living, that, that there's something about the law that gets in us there can be a lot of love in it. There might be a, some hate in it once in a while. But there is something about practicing law and being a lawyer that is a tough, difficult, sometimes really rewarding experience. And it's a way of life that is not for everybody. 100% agreed. And it's a necessary profession. You know, I know that many people in the world will quickly say they can't stand lawyers and lawyers are the root of all problems and things like that. But it, 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 it does, it does have the ability to latch on and not let go. And, and that's also changed. Let's see if you agree with this. When I started out, you know, the, the fastest way to get a hold of me was the phone or a fax. Those were the options. And when I went home, which at times was, you know, 10 or 11 o'clock at night, but when I went home, that was it. There was no other way to get a hold of me. I didn't have an iPhone. Today, 
especially as I was ending my career and I was working on the, the, the biggest debtor's case I'd ever had as I was uh, finishing up that case and that was going to be the, the, the springboard then to then pack it in. You know, people would get a hold of me at 11 o'clock at night by texting me. Now, I didn't have to look. I could turn the sound down so it wouldn't ding, but it, it was remarkable what was going on. You know, there were you know, 6,000 creditors and they all had my phone number. <laughs> they could all text me anytime they wanted and they did because they wanted their damn money. And, you know, that's, that's a different, and that's kind of the add-on I was talking about. Not only does the law get in its tentacles into you and doesn't let go, but the, as much as technology is wonderful, it makes the practice of law all the more difficult because it, it, it further takes away from that wall that you try to have to have some form of, of, of life. Mark Shakin, it has been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Love Thy Lawyer podcast. Thanks very much for having me on. It's been a blast. I really have enjoyed it. That's it for today's episode of Love Thy Lawyer. If you enjoyed listening, please share it with a friend and subscribe to the podcast. If you have comments or suggestions, send me an email. I promise I'll respond. Take a look at our website at lovethylawyer.com where you can find all of our episodes, transcripts, photographs, and information. Thanks as always to my guests who share their wisdom and to Joel Katz for music, Brian Matheson for technical support, and Tracy Harvey. I'm Lewis Goodman. How many bar exams have you taken? Five. Five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I had Pennsylvania, Texas, Kansas, Missouri, and Colorado. Colorado was the one I said that was my choice because I wanted to move here.